Rashida Willard is the Principal Executive Officer at Collective Works Consulting, LLC. Throughout her career, she has been able to develop and champion initiatives that help promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, DEIJ. Willard has launched programs for new employees of color, developed strategies to retain historically underrepresented students and employees, and worked to create effective DEIJ strategies that are aligned with organizational goals. These efforts include equity consultation with all levels of the organization, training and professional development, leading socially, social equity strategic planning processes and action-oriented strategies around DEIJ. Rashida is committed to creating culturally engaging spaces for systematically non-dominant employees and students, as well as encouraging development for all people across the learning continuum. In the community, she is a strong advocate for historically underserved populations. Rashida started the annual Northwest Regional Equity Conference, where people from all over the country attend to share anti-racist strategies was a graduate of Social Justice Leadership Institute for the Washington State Community College System for 2017 to 2018, and was nominated as a real hero for the Learn Here project in 2018. Willard won the Leadership Excellence Award and was named one of the top 50 leaders from the National Diversity Council. Rashida holds a master's in business administration, bachelor's in business administration, and an associate in organizational dynamics. She is currently attending North Central University, pursuing a doctorate in education with a concentration in organizational leadership. Her current research explores the strategic faculty. You, hold on, I can read. Her current research <laughs> explores the st strategies faculty utilize to create culturally engaging campus environments for students of color attending predominantly white institutions. This research will be used to examine and identify strategies close to the retention and completion gap among students of color in higher education. So for this, we're gonna quit our broadcast, have Rajita join, Rashida, I'm so sorry, Rashida join, and then we're, we'll be right back. <laughs> Hello, if you are not already in the stage area, please do so and I will let Rashida take it away. Hello everyone, can y'all hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? I hope. We see it. Yay! Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, throughout this presentation, I may ask you to participate a little bit in the chat. Um, and I really hope that you'll be able to expand um, your learning today um, and learn something new. Uh, you definitely have to be willing to do it, but, um, but uh, I just want you to start building your own awareness and your competencies around uh, some of these things, privilege and oppression. All right, so my name is Rashida Willard. Um, I use she and her pronouns. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about privilege and oppression, like I said, through my own lens. So I'm gonna weave in some stories of my own personal stories to help sort of bring these um, concepts to life for you. Can we go to the next slide? Alexis, yes, um, say thank you instead of saying sorry. So thank you all for your, pa your patience. I appreciate that. So I first wanna acknowledge that I'm conducting this keynote address today on the traditional lands of the Calix and the Lower Columbia peoples. I further want to acknowledge the 29 federally recognized tribes that make up the state of Washington and the many tribes that are not federally recognized and those that are still fighting for re recognition. I pay respects to the elders and the caretakers that have stewarded these lands throughout generations and that are still here today. 
So while I'd love to pay respects, um, I don't want this land acknowledgement just to be something that we say and we move on. Um, I wanna bring your attention today um, to the missing and murdered indigenous women issues that is happening right here in our country. Next slide. How many of you have heard about the missing and murdered indigenous women issue that is happening right now? That has been happening. I'd love to hear in the chat. Yes, no. Seen it on TikTok. Good. So, mm -hmm. good. I'm glad that you all have have heard this. Yes. Some people haven't. So. Four out of five indigenous women experience and are impacted by violence. Native women are 10 times more likely to be murdered than any other group. And thousands of indigenous women have gone missing or have been, uh, have been murdered. And the numbers are actually grossly underrepresented and underreported. Indigenous women experience sexual violence from non-Native people at extreme rates on, the, on their own reservations. And, and on some reservations, it's as high as 96%. So I tell you all of this not to start on a bad note, uh, but to bring awareness to this issue and stand in solita solidarity with, uh, with our, our Native community. This is how you move beyond acknowledging land into awareness and hopefully into action. So again, you'll see the MMIW hashtag at the bottom. I'm hoping that you will take some time to research um, the missing and uh, murdered indigenous women and learn about what's happening and, and the different things that are going on to, um, to help bring those women home and to find justice as well. Next slide. So I also want us to take a moment and just quiet ourselves for a second. I'm going to I'm going to take 60 seconds and I'm going to stop for a second and just be quiet and ask everybody to do the same uh, as we remember the lives of uh, the eight people that were murdered um, in an overt act of racism and sexual violence, um, six of them being Asian women. So I'm gonna stop for a second and take some time. Thank you for quieting yourselves and um, paying respect to those women that were murdered, those people that were murdered. There's so much to unpack here. When we're thinking about how Asian women are fetishized and over-sexualized, since the pandemic, we saw, we've seen an increase in uh, anti Asian violence and sentiments, we have to be mindful of the ways in which racism is so pervasive and it's destructive. So what I want you to do is I want you to make yourself aware, do some research and take a stand against racism. Next slide. All right, so now I'll start this presentation by telling you a little bit about who I am. So I'm a wife. I've been married for 25 years. Um, we are a biracial family. I'm a coog mom. So I have three children and one bonus child. You'll see my son, Hezzy, 
one with the long hair right here or in, uh, right next to me. Um, that's my son, Hezzy. Um, he graduated from Pullman, WSU Pullman, uh, with a history degree. And he is uh, moving on to Grenada, actually, to pursue an MBA. Uh, my son, Josiah, is next to Hezzy. He currently attends WSU in Vancouver. Um, he'll be graduating soon. I have uh, my little girl on the end there. Her name is Amaria. Um, she is a junior in high school. And Makaya, my bonus daughter, is next to my husband. Um, and he's my son's girlfriend. So they met in at WSU, uh, I think their sophomore year maybe. And um, they, and she graduated also from WSU. So I'm a daughter. I'm a TT. My, my, my nephews and nieces all call me TT. I'm a social justice advocate. I'm one that's not able to just sit around and be ignorant about issues that uh, impact other people. I'm a survivor. In 2013, I was diagnosed with a um, rare and aggressive form of breast cancer. After a year of chemotherapy and radiation, um, I was in, I am in remission. I'm a pro professional. I work as the VP of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I also own my own business. I'm a black woman. What? Side note, your daughter, oh, my bonus daughter has the, the same name as my daughter. Oh, as your daughter. Awesome. Hey, yes, we're a whole coop family. So why is this important? Why do why am I telling you all this stuff about myself and who I am and all my different identities, the, the identities that I hold? Um, many people think about, you know, how we shouldn't focus on uh, difference uh, because we're all just one race, right? Uh, but you need to understand that identities are so central to how you navigate everyday life. It is important to know what those identities are and um, to understand how our identities impact the way that we navigate and shape us. Next slide. So our identities really shape how we navigate and show up in the world. I think I, I said that before, but as a mom of biracial children, I realize that I have to advocate for my kids. Um, they experience bias and discrimination, not only from their peers, but also from their teachers. As a breast cancer survivor, I quickly realized that black women have a 40% higher death rate than white women. I found that black women are diagnosed at later stages. They receive a lack of timely follow-up and they experience delays in, in treatment. I realized a very bleak survival rate due to doctors not checking their own biases. I also have to contend with this history of experimentation on black women's bodies, right? As a professional, I realized that my full authentic black self was not welcomed, was not always welcomed in, into uh, the workplace. I understand that my Afro or my locks or my natural hair, it, it's deemed as unprofessional, right? These are things that I have to think about constantly. Um, I, I just recently decided to lock my hair. So I've, I, for all my life, have relaxed my hair. And what that means is that you put, um, you know, chemicals on it to make it straight. And a lot of that, you know, comes from um, sort of this idea of, of not wanting to, not necessarily wanting to stand out or, or I want my hair to look professional. And so for so long, professional is straight, right? Your hair has to be straight to be professional. So I put chemicals on my hair for years and years and years. It was only until I uh, went through breast cancer, my hair fell out that I said, you know what? I'm no longer gonna put chemicals on my hair just to have straight hair to be deemed as professional. 
So I started growing my my natural hair. Um, but you have to think about those those things when you start to navigate in professional spaces. You know, now I'm now I'm I'm locking my hair, and so this is going to be dreadlocks. And so I'm thinking, how are people going to receive me? This is I'm just letting my hair be natural and do what it naturally does. The standard is white. So I understand that to the extent that I can assimilate or emulate whiteness, the better that the better I do um, in the workplace. And that's real. That is real. I learned how to code switch. How many of you have ever heard of code switching? Anyone? I put the poll up, so they should. Be uh, no, you don't need to put it up. I, I'll we'll do it on the next slide. Never mind. <laughs> Good people have heard of it. Well, I learned that I have to have a foot in two worlds, oftentimes, right? I have to adjust the way that I talk to ensure that people know that I'm not a threat. I have to put on a smile sometimes so that you all don't see the weight of me being an angry black woman. I have to move out of the way or not say what I really mean or, you know, count my words um, sometimes. When I talk about code switching, I think about my grandmother all the time. My grandmother was an old Southern black woman. Um, she had a really heavy accent and also spoke in African-American vernacular. But I remember when my grandmother thought that she was talking white. And she'd be on the phone and she, she we, we knew when she was talking to white people. She'd answer the phone, she'd go, hello. And she would have this voice that was, you know, a little bit higher, what she thought was proper. And, and we knew oh, she's talking to white people. So she needs to make sure that she is couching her words and that she's, she's turning off some of her African American vernacular and that she's turning off some of that Southern, you know, deep Southern, uh, you know, uh, voice that she had. Cold switching sometimes is necessary for survival but it doesn't negate the fact that it is harmful. It causes assimilation. Um, it causes us to maintain the status quo. Um, and sometimes it can cause us to actually de-identify with our rich and beautiful cultures. It causes us to not bring in that beauty of difference. So let's go to the next slide. I have a quick poll for you. How often do you code switch? So I have, uh, you can put up the poll now, Heather. <laughs> okay, it's up. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, sorry, I jumped the ball there. Or the, oh, that, oh, that's okay. That's okay. How often do you code switch? And I don't know if I'll be able to see um, the results when they come in, or if you wanna just tell me. see so as of right now you have 66.7 percent saying sis this is my life i do it uh 27.3 percent saying i have done it a couple of times 9.1 percent well it keeps changing but yes everybody's answering so far we have a few votes okay great so so most of you do know what it is and you have had to code switch. How does that make you feel when you have to code switch? How does it make you feel? Does anybody want to uh, put in the chat how it makes you feel when you have to code switch? 
So I see that some folks say, you know, oh, somebody said I do it for my job as a bartender or to make people feel comfortable. Um, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just having those two, the, those feet, you know, your foot in both worlds. Some people say it feels like you're hiding your true self. Exactly. Like you're giving up. Um, like you're never accepted into any group. Um, people who are around swear you're trying to be something else. But in reality, I just want to be able to do my job without having to fit their agenda. Yes. Absolutely. It does not feel good to code switch. And sometimes, you know, I, I, I worked in corporate for many years, for like 17 years. I worked in corporate and a lot of code switching in corporate. And it, it literally sucks your soul out. <laughs> Um, and then when I came, you know, to higher education, I realized, you know what, my students need to see me. My students need to be able to see me as my 100% full authentic self. So again, it's about how we bring in these identities into everything that we do. And it, it, it makes it important for us to know how our identities hold privilege and then how they might carry oppression, right? Okay, next slide. So the dreaded word privilege, I want you to, in the chat, tell me, when I hear privilege, what do I think of? When I hear that word privilege, what, is, what do I think about? When I say privilege, what do you all think about? A white dude telling me how periods work. Money. Things made easier because of my skin color. Some aspect of my identity that I don't need to worry about or think about. Advantage having to work twice as hard to get what someone gets more easily, education, mm -hmm. access to opportunity, positionality, money, all of that. So people tend to cringe when they hear privilege. I'm not privileged, I grew up poor, right? And, and that money is to it, right? So, uh, when I talk about privilege, I need you to understand that I don't mean money. Um, I don't mean that your life hasn't been hard. What I mean when I talk about privilege is that your privileged identity has not made your life hard. I'm just, uh, I put this picture in here because for me, this is the ultimate, you know, privilege, right? Privilege would be being able to go to the store, grab some shampoo, and go home. <laughs> or I, I'm going to say, not shampoo, I'm going to say conditioner. I should be able to go to the store and find my hair products easily, right? I mean, sometimes people can go to the gas station and find, you know, hair products. But for me, it takes an entire, you know, it's a whole thing, right? I call my friends, I say, hey, do y'all need anything from the, the hair store? Because I'm going, I'm going to the hair store. Um, does anybody, you know, need anything? Because this is my aisle at Fred Meyer. This is my aisle. It's overpriced and it's a small little section of the long, you know, couple aisles of, Shampoo. So privilege does not mean that you have a lot of money. Privilege means that you can go and easily pick up hair products. You don't have to take a trip to Portland across the river to go to the hair store 
call all your friends, tell them you, you're taking a trip to the hair store. Do you need anything, right? It, it, it impacts the way that I navigate. I was even thinking about uh, traveling. If I travel, I need to bring hair products. So I have to check a bag because I'm not sure that wherever I go, they're gonna be able to have the, the things that I need to take care of my basic needs. Another story I'll tell you that kind of gives perspective and um, some of you that know me may know this story, but uh, I moved to Battleground in 2014, um, which is kind of a rural area of, if I don't know where everybody is from, if everybody's from different places, um, but I, I moved kind of to a rural area, area to find more uh, land, to live on more land. But as a biracial family, of course, um, it didn't it didn't go well. I had a swastika and a WP painted on a fence right next to me. My daughter was harassed in school for that entire year. So privilege is being able to move wherever you want without fear of racism, bias, discrimination. That's what that's what privilege is. Privilege doesn't mean that you have a lot of money. So when you have time, I'd love for you to look up Unpacking the Invisible Sack by Peggy McIntosh. It is old. It's old, but it is a good one. Next slide. So systemic racism is embedded into our systems and it's evident in, in outcomes of every structure. I really need you all to understand that systemic racism is different than individual acts of racism. Systemic racism is, is the systematic distribution of resources, power, and opportunity in our society that benefits one race at the detriment of others. Systemic racism is real, but not everybody believes that it's real. So we have folks who are making um, decisions, higher level folks making decisions that say cystic racism is not real. But yet, next slide. But yet we can see these disparities in all of our structural systems. We can see it in healthcare, we can see it in discipline, we can see it in educational outcomes, we see it in the justice system, we see it in housing. What does this look like? All of those examples that I gave you all of the indigenous, the, the indigenous women that are uh, murdered or missing disproportionately higher than other women, that's systemic racism. The model minority myth for Asian Americans and the anti-Asian violence is the over-representation of black and brown men in prisons is the intentional exclusion of economic access and historical uh, historical exclusion for um, economic access for black people. It's the historical experimentation of black women's bodies and the gross inequities and disparities in all of these systems. Systemic racism should not be construed with the individual acts of, of, of discrimination. Systemic racism is laws and policies and, and, and practices of racism that contributes to all of these um, disparities that we see. Next slide. So while we as Americans, we pride ourselves on moving away from burning crosses and wearing hoods, we're, we're, we're not that, you know, this is not us. Yet white supremacy and racism still exist. So when you look at this diagram, you can see the overt ways of white supremacy. Uh, up at the top, kind of, you know, there's lynching, hate crimes, the N-word, racial slurs, but under the surface, we are still racist. 
So in looking at that diagram, you see, uh, you know, certain things such as calling the police on black people or colorblindness. How many of us have said, I don't see color? Or how many of us have heard that? How many of us have heard, I don't see color? Or said it, but you don't have to out yourself. Anyone? Yes. Heard it. <coughs> yes. People say it all the time. I just treat people as people. We're all humans. There's, we don't see color, right? But if you don't see color, you don't see the experiences of other people who have been marginalized based on their identity, right? When you tell people to move on because racism is was 400 years ago. I mean, even I've heard, heard people say that. You don't acknowledge the harmful economic, psychological, and physical effects that racism actually has on our country today. It is damaging to say that you are colorblind or to say that you are uh, to evade color, right? Is to, uh, is to ignore the experiences of people of color. Someone said the worst is all lives matter in response to black lives matter. Absolutely. It's that, that idea of someone saying, I've been harmed and someone else saying, no, you haven't. No, it's not, it's not that bad, right? So it's important for us to, to be informed about the ways in which white supremacy still exists and racism still exists it's the socially accessible socially acceptable you know way of of uh of moving through life so yes um it you know i i agree with i agree with all of that um with everything that's going on in the chat right now around you know Again, it's it's this idea of people saying, look at this data, look at my pain, look at all this stuff that's happening. And then other people saying, well, no, no, it's not that serious. No, I don't think so. So it's important to believe people when they tell you what they're going through. This is how we move forward. Next slide. I had to put these in there and y'all can look them up later. Um, but these are examples of how racism shows up every day in, in policing people's behavior. You don't belong in the park. You shouldn't be here barbecuing. You shouldn't be selling water on the side of the street. You shouldn't be sleeping in your own home. You shouldn't be watching TV. I mean, in your own home, you should be sleeping in the common area in our school. How should we navigate in a way that causes us to belong? How should we navigate? Next slide. It's about belonging. How are we creating spaces for people to feel like they belong? And how do we start to move the needle forward on issues of racism and inclusion and belonging? How do we do that? Next slide. How do we propose that we change? And I want, you to, I want you to think about that. Um, how do we close systemic disparities, close the gaps on uh, the systemic disparities if we can't even acknowledge that racism exists? We should not become so comfortable in our silence that we ignore the oppression that's happening with other groups. That's why I started this off, uh, started us off in solidarity with our indigenous community, with our Asian American community, 
we have to start thinking about that. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna ask you a question and it could be rhetorical. You don't have to answer it, I guess, right at this moment, but what keeps you from fully leaning into this work? It's something that I need you to just think about, okay? Just think about it. What keeps you from fully leaning into this work? Why are we not moving the needle forward on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Next slide. So allyship is not complicated, uh, but it does require you to be intentional. So this work will require us to take the perspective of others, to listen to stories, um, to listen and not dispute. If somebody is saying, my life matters, don't say, well, you know, no, everybody's life matters. Okay? Listen to the stories of others and listen not, not again to dispute, but to understand. We all have biases, but we have to start interrupting this problematic thinking. Um, take a risk. The one thing that I, that I hear people say all the time is like, I'm scared to say the wrong thing. You're gonna have to step out of that discomfort. Step out of the discomfort and be okay with uh, being wrong. Take a risk. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to take that risk. You have to educate yourself. Build relationships with people who are not like yourselves. If you, uh, you know, can't necessarily get out, guess what? There is a Google machine. There is YouTube. You can do all kinds of education from your computer. So there are no excuses. Whatever you do, please do not ask your BIPOC uh, colleagues, friends, family to expend that energy for you. Do that work on your own. And when I say BIPOC, I mean Black, Indigenous, people of color, okay? Tell somebody about the missing and, and, and murdered Indigenous women. Be reflective. Be self-reflective too. Be, look at your look at yourself. Be self-reflective. Determine how your own privilege and your power might impact the way that you navigate and how others navigate this world. Next slide. And lastly, as a student, it is important for you to acknowledge how racism has impacted your communities. You all are influential in your own circles. You make impact. You do, you may not see it, but you do, you make impact. So while you are in your own spheres of influence, I ask for you to step out and, um, and, and start to make that important and uh, lasting impact on your community. And remember that we're all interconnected. It takes everybody to do this work. Uh, we are all in this together. Everybody's on a journey. Um, but I, I, I really ask for you to lean in to it. And I think that that was, uh, that's it. Do you, I wanna take a moment to see if y'all have any questions for me. So somebody in the chat, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. I was just gonna say somebody in the chat said, you know, I would also say fear both that if you give your all to advocacy, what will not change in my lifetime and also fear of white nationalists being violent towards me or my family. Absolutely. So that's a real thing, right? For for BIPOC and for, for communities of color, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of uh, a toll on your body um, psychological toll on your on yourself, um, and 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 violence is a real thing, right? And so, yes, it is fear. 
And also remember things that don't change in your lifetime will impact folks in, in, in um, generations ahead of you. Any other questions? Just that they love this so much. <laughs> Wish you could work diversity at WSU Global. And then uh, that this talk was so moving and some thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you all. Here we go. How do you recommend navigating the very real danger of being a woman while trying not to stereotype men you don't know that you might perceive as a threat? Mm -hmm. It all takes unlearning, right? Um, so while we have our, like everything that I come in with, I'm just going to use myself as a black woman. I know I, I've seen threats. I have, I, I'm coming in with a lifetime, right, of oppression. Um, so navigating that is really tough. You might be a little bit more careful sometimes. You might be like, you may not be fully trusting. Um, so I would just say, you know, relationship is the biggest thing. Being in relationship with people who are not like you, um, who don't hold the same uh, identities as, as you hold is a really great way to start to unlearn some of the biases that we have in our, um, in our own, uh, heads or the things that we think about our own biases but also you know i'm not going to also say that i don't call people out because i do i also just call it out right you know your behavior um is this could be seen as threatening or i might say you know when when this happens this is how i feel and i just call it out and i feel like that helps people to see their own biases as well Samantha. Samantha, definitely, my email is right there. Um, I am not adopting anyone, but um, I would be happy to talk to you further. So please, there's my email, contact me. So I wanna take the time to just say thank you all for having me today. Um, I really enjoyed this time with you all, so thank you.